goodness. Well, one, one of the uh, great benefits of, of Jane being here a second time to moderate this panel and filling in for Erica is, is that I get to correct something I did in the introduction the last time where I, I looked directly at Jane, who I've been listening for, to for years, uh, and, and remem misremembered the name of the podcast she hosts, But Why. Uh, and I knew it was a conjunction, but I thought, and why isn't right, or why isn't right, and I finally landed on the right one. So again, I am delighted to welcome as our moderator, Jane Lindholm, who is a producer and host, former host of Vermont Edition, and, and host of But Why. And I wanted to share a, a quick story. I, I'm sure Jane won't remember this, but back when I was the director of the Humanities Center at the University of Vermont, you were hosting the Vermont Edition uh, a book show. Uh, and you interviewed me, I think hoping that I would tell people to read Dostoevsky or They March Into Sunlight or something like that. But at the time, my kids were uh, in their, their, their tweens, and they were reading a book called The Mysterious Benedict Society, which I had been reading along with them. And I was gushing about this children's book, and I, I think you were a little taken aback and not, not, not really hoping that that's what the director of the Humanity Center would deliver. But, uh, but I hope it inspired at least a few, reader, uh, a few of the listeners nevertheless. So, uh, Jane, delighted to have you moderating our second panel of the day, uh, which is on the anti-war movement on U.S. campuses. Thank you. Thanks, David. And, you know, who would I be to say not to read a children's book, having now uh, moved my career into the realm of children's education? And, and perhaps uh, somewhat relatedly, th this question of but why that kids ask all the time, but why, but why, is also the question that journalists ask and that so many of us ask throughout our lives. And so I think it's, it's somewhat fitting. Uh, to be moderating the panel that I was originally supposed to be moderating to ask these questions of why. Um, and I'd like to introduce our guests for this panel. Uh, David Marinus, right here, is a New York Times bestselling author, fellow of the Society of American Historians, and a visiting distinguished professor at Vanderbilt University. He's been affiliated with the Washington Post for more than 40 years as an editor and writer, and twice won Pulitzer Prizes at the newspaper. In 1993, he received the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for his coverage of Bill Clinton, and in 2007, he was part of a team that won the Pulitzer for coverage of the Virginia Tech shooting. He was also a Pulitzer finalist three other times, including for one of his books, They Marched Into Sunlight, War and Peace, Vietnam and America, October 1967. And if any of you were here last night for David's keynote speech, you heard a little bit about the reporting that he did for that book. Uh, he lives with his wife, Linda, a retired environmentalist in Washington, D.C. and Madison, Wisconsin, their hometown. Welcome, David. Nice to have you with us. Gregory Craig is also with us today. When Greg was president uh, of the Harvard Undergraduate Council in 1966 and 1967, he led a group of 100 student body presidents from colleges and universities all over the US in writing a letter to President Lyndon Johnson on behalf of their student body constituents, raising questions about US policy in Vietnam. In response, the Secretary of State invited a group of students to meet with him to discuss Vietnam. That meeting resulted in alienating a whole generation of student leaders who then became involved in the successful effort to jump, dump Johnson in 1968. Um, Greg went on to work for Senator Ted Kennedy as his foreign, senior foreign policy advisor, as well as for Secretary of State Madeleine Albright as the director of police and planning in the State Department. He also worked for President Clinton during his impeachment and for President Obama as his first White House counsel. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And we're here to talk about the anti-war movement and student protests on college campus during the Vietnam War. David, as you spoke about last night and in your celebrated book, They Marched Into Sunlight, you see 1967 as an inflection point, both in Vietnam and in the sentiment here in the United States. Can you sort of set the scene for us as far as the anti-war movement went and, and how it was evolving in 1967? Uh, sure, Jane. Um, thank you. I, I would say actually that early 1968 was more of an inflection point 
um, in the terms of change. But this fall of 1967 um, had this different electric dynamism to it, but it was more of, of uncertainty. Um, it was right after the counterculture was moving across the country, you know, from the summer of love in San Francisco. Um, college campuses were starting to really come to grips with, with both the cultural and the <clears throat> political change. Um, it was before the Tet Offensive in 68, where, where the, the country, the public, um, led by Walter Cronkite, the CBS voice of God, um, sort of started to turn strongly against the war. Um, but October of 1967, I was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin, and I remember this sort of feeling of the world changing every week. You know, you'd wake up and it felt like it was a different world. It was just, everything was moving so fast, but you didn't know where it was going. Um, so that um, as a guest who uh, last night, who also was at Wisconsin in 1967 pointed out, he woke up to a, first to see a panty raid and then to see the protest. That's, that's the way it was changing so fast. And so many of the um, young people who were there in, in the fall of 67, freshmen like me, went from wearing sport coats to blue jean jackets, you know, within, I wore my first blue jean jacket that October. Um, and it, it was- Seminal that, moment, clearly this is a core memory for you. I wish it still fit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I interviewed Father Berrigan in a blue jean jacket, I remember doing that. Uh, but, um, Anyway, so the reason I was fascinated by 1967 is because you didn't know the answers yet. You didn't know what would happen with the war. You didn't know whether the, the ability to stop the war would succeed. Um, and it was just this, this moment. Um, you know, at, at Wisconsin, three years later, in uh, August of 1970, there was a horrible bombing there. Um, in, in the physics building where a researcher was killed. And that sort of in some sense marked an end, uh, an end of a certain form of the anti-war movement. I, I hate to ever use the phrase end of innocence because life is never really innocent. It's sort of a fallacy. Um, but it what did mark a change. And I didn't want to write about that because you already knew what was happening. 1967, you really didn't. Beyond wearing a, a jean jacket, what were you doing on campus in 67? Well, um, I grew up in, uh, my father was a newspaper man. He was um, then the city editor of the progressive newspaper in Madison, the Capital Times. Um, so, and my older siblings were scholars and I was kind of the dumb kid in the family. But, I had already realized I wasn't going to be able to play shortstop for the Milwaukee Braves, so I was looking for um, other things. And, um, but I've always had sort of a reporter's, observer's um, sensibility. Um, I was, as the protest unfolded that day, day, October 18th, 1967, I was there. I was on the edge of the crowd. I was not in the Commerce Building where the violence took place. But I witnessed it. I felt the first tear gas on the Madison campus, which was um, the, you know, it was the community smell and scent for the next four years after that. This was the beginning of four years of protest. Um, I had already been somewhat politically aware because of my family situation, but it certainly had a profound effect on me as well over the next four years. But my father, who was the city editor, used to say, Dave, you can do what you feel you have to do, but I don't want to see your picture on the front page of my newspaper. <laughs> so so yeah, I was sort of careful about that. Uh, Greg, maybe you want to start with your sartorial choices, but tell us a little bit about what you were doing on campus at Harvard that same year. Well, David, with all respect, it began earlier oh, than course. your I freshman know. year in 1967. Yeah, no, <laughs> My first re recollections of the anti-war movement on campus were the teach-ins that yes. occurred the spring of 1965, right. which were actually very exciting and very learned, very academic, very um, uh, balanced, I thought, and 
they would take place between 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. in the morning, and they would have a flow of some of the greatest experts. This is at Harvard on China policy, on regional history, on uh, strategic thinking, geopolitical thinking. And Sanders Theater was filled every hour. People would come in after the breaks and until one o'clock in the morning. And it was, it, the atmosphere was electric because we thought that we were getting real solid information about what was going on in that region of the world. Um, and so, it would lead us inevitably to be critical of U.S. policy as early as the spring of 1965. But there was an additional thing that happened to me that I recall very sharply because in 1965 it was John Kennedy's 25th reunion at Harvard had he lived and he would have returned to participate in that reunion. But since he couldn't come back, McGeorge Bundy came he had not attended, there was nobody defending U.S. policy in Vietnam in 65 that came to these teach-ins, but Bundy came back and agreed to answer questions about U.S. policy in Vietnam at a, a lecture hall. This was the first week in June, so most of the students were gone, but the reunion classes were there, the Harvard faculty was there, people who were working to raise money for their summers <laughs> were there. And so I sat in at the Lowell Lecture Hall and listened to McGeorge Bundy defend the war. And one of the questions he was asked uh, from Professor Benjamin Schwartz, who was a U.S. expert on China, we can argue about the past, Mr. Bundy. By, at the time, Mac Bundy was the national security advisor to the President of the United States and an instrumental architect of U.S. policy in Vietnam. We can argue about the past, Mr. Bundy, I'm concerned about what your plans are for the future. Can you reassure the people in this lecture hall that the United States has no plans to send major new troop commitments to, the, to Vietnam? And Bundy said, I can reassure you that that's not gonna happen. Well, yeah. Two right months later, 200,000 people were exactly. sent to Vietnam. Yeah. I felt personally that not only had he misled me, but he'd misled a pretty important collection of people that could influence public policy. Now, in 1966, another thing happened on the campus that also influenced um, our views about the war. Um, because uh, of Kennedy's death, the Institute of Politics was created, and Dick Neustadt, who was the director of the Institute of Politics, thought that one of the ways of getting undergraduates engaged in public policy was to bring people from Washington, D.C. to talk about what it's like to be in public service. And one of the very first people that they invited was Robert McNamara. <laughs> and of course, immediately, those of us in the activist community, and most of us by that, at that time were still focused on the civil rights issue. I'd gone to Mississippi in 64 and 65, and we were completely engaged in voting rights issues rather than the war in Vietnam. But McNamara came to town and the issue was whether or not he would respond to general questions in public on the issue of the war in Vietnam. And the authorities at Harvard thought, no, no, that could be a little embarrassing. So we were going to restrict McNamara's activities to common rooms in various houses with a select group of questioners and students pre-selected to participate in. So there was no public defense, no public criticism. It was all done privately. And the students, I think correctly, thought this was not the way the Secretary of Defense engaged in getting us into war, coming to a university, should deal with this issue. And so, um, and by the way, the students at that time were technologically very sophisticated. We had um, people on top of all the houses and we knew that McNamara was in Quincy House <laughs> and he was gonna have to get out of Quincy House. Well, what happened was a, a bunch of activists spotted uh, Bob McNamara with only one security person rushing out of the back door of Quincy House um, and surrounded him and started asking him questions about US policy and chanting. It turned into a, a larger group, probably two or 300 people surrounding McNamara. It got a good deal of attention and Harvard formally apologized. And Secretary McNamara, um, who I talked about this later on, lost his temper. They, they put him up on a car and he says, I'll answer all your questions, but I'm tougher than you are. He says, I've been, I grew up in Berkeley, I know how to be tough. Mm -hmm. And he was making it into a 
sort of a manly thing as opposed to let's have a r sure. serious discussion about the war. And the kids were having not, none of it, and so they started chanting, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? That was a very dramatic um, moment in 1966. That summer, there was a debate at the National Student Association Congress that was held at Champaign-Urbana between Al Lowenstein and David Harris that was in a room about this size, and twice as many people as are here today were at this room, all sort of age 18, 19, 20. And the issue of the day, which was, by the way, this debate was organized not by the organizers of the Congress, it was by the students who thought we should have something about the anti-war movement. And Lowenstein made the, took the position that we should change people's minds about the war so that we could change the policy. And the way you did that was through electoral and democratic means. David Harris took the position that opposing the war was a moral statement. You had to tear up your draft card. You had to go to jail. You had to lie down in front of troop trains to do it. And then Al said, well, I think everybody who does that has a right to do that and should do it, but feel no expectation that you're going to change policy. And so Harris says, well, what do you recommend to change policy? And Lowenstein said, well, if you could get 100 student presidents and editors to sign a letter raising questions about the war in Vietnam to the President of the United States, that might get some attention and people might th respond to that. Well, th that could be done. We did that in two or three weeks. And the letter is signed by not anti-war activists. It's signed by captains of the football team and mm -hmm. presidents of the fraternities and student council presidents, and it was all in the context of we're writing this letter because our constituents are concerned about this policy, and there is this overlay of they may have to go and serve, but it's also this issue of we're involved in a war that we don't really understand and people are dying, please explain it to us. So that was, that's even before you got involved, David. Well, you've adequately proved that you're older than me. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there were uh, teach-ins at Wisconsin as well in 1965. And as I pointed out last night, one of the great ironies was that a terrific sociology professor, William Sewell, who led those teach-ins, became the chancellor two years later and suffered the consequences of what happened in the Commerce Building in that protest against mm -hmm. Dow Chemical Company. You both grew up with fathers who had served in the military. Mm. Greg, your father was a naval officer who served in World War II, and David, your father also fought in World War II, right? Yes. I think, you know, for even for girls, you are a product of your parents in many ways, and, and their lives serve to inform how you choose to live yours, whether it is in opposition to the values they represent or in line with the values they represent. Or there, there's, there's tension one way or another. David, how did your father's service and his avowed communism affect how you approached your own um, perspective on the Vietnam War when that came around? Yeah, I am in so many ways a product of my parents. My father, um, who grew up in Brooklyn and then went out to the Midwest to the University of Michigan, um, was radicalized by that experience in the late 1930s. And um, when World War II broke out, he volunteered, enlisted. And because it was very interesting, the, the US military was segregated then completely. And the, the black troops, the African-American troops, had white officers. And those white officers tended to be either Southern racists, because the military figured they knew how to deal with black people, or Northern radicals. And my father was one of those. So he became the commander of an all-black unit in World War II. And that, that affected him in, in profound and important ways in terms of my family's sensibility to the issues of race in America, um, which he inculcated in me and my siblings uh, very deeply. You know, I'm sorry for all the Red Sox fans here, but one of the things he taught me was to never root for the Red Sox because they were the last team to integrate. Um, 
That's true. Yep. But, uh, but he also, um, in 1952, was a journalist in Detroit, Michigan, working for the Detroit Times. And the House on American Activities Committee came to Detroit largely to try to purge the, uh, the communists or radicals from the United Auto Workers, from the unions. And during those hearings, um, there was a, a woman who had infiltrated the Communist Party in Michigan um, and named 800 names that she'd kept files for years. And my father was <coughs> named and he was fired from his job and blacklisted. We bounced around for five years after that until he finally was saved by the Capital Times in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so all of that had a profound effect on me. But what, what, one of the interesting things about my father was uh, so many of the former communists or radicals became um, cynics after that or neoconservatives or you know just turned away from life. And my father remained his, kept his optimism and taught me the lessons of what he had learned. Never accept any rigid ideologies. Search for the truth wherever you find it. And so his suffering really was to the benefit of his children. And that's sort of shaped my whole career as a journalist and as a human being. Hmm. Greg, what kind of conversations did you have with your father as you began to shift your focus from the civil rights movement to anti-war? Well, his military experience wasn't nearly as important to him as his uh, experience on university campuses because he had made a career and a life of, of being a university uh, administrator. In fact, Dean Kaufman of the University of Wisconsin, oh. I am sure, knew my father because they did right? almost the same thing exactly. Uh -huh. And he was, um, our, our home state was Vermont, but he was on the faculty at Stanford University and was dean of students at Stanford for many years. Um, where I spent time growing up. But he left in 61 because he was so excited about John Kennedy and joined the Peace Corps with Sarge Shriver. And so that he was very much part of the idea of liberal change and transformation and international, you know, that the United States could make a difference in a positive way internationally. Um, so he was, and he was not um, someone who was, um, a believer in the omniscient wisdom of military brass. I mean, I think it was something that he learned to distrust that kind of authority. Um, so that I, I think he had no problems with raising questions about the wisdom of U.S. policy in Vietnam. Hmm. But he had the same, the same college experiences. I had the same college experiences that you describe in your book, the University of Wisconsin had different people, but the, the events were similar to what happened at Harvard in 69, mm -hmm. what happened at Yale in 70, right. and university campuses all over. And that was very much part of the anti-war experience, was what, it, what was happening on campuses. Yeah, and you said you, you, you were a participant in writing this letter questioning the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War and the policy. What did you think was going to happen? From that well, letter. we assumed that the, everybody would read the letter and change policy immediately. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did make, actually, Senator, it did make the New York Times, which yeah. was uh, an important event that, you know, student, um, student leaders could raise questions about national policy that extended beyond ROTC or Dow, you know, uh, Dow Chemical on the campus. And what happened was um, we got a, an answer back from the Secretary of State who invited a group of 40 student presidents to come meet with him to, to talk about the war. And I think it was um, in good faith that they thought uh, by exposing their thinking to us, we would be convinced and that we would agree that the war was wise and should go forward. Precisely the opposite happened. I can remember Rick Weidman, who was the president of the student body at Colgate University, asked a question after Dean Rusk had uh, methodically explained the policy of increased pressure to force the Vietnamese to the negotiating table. And once the, the increased pressure had forced the Vietnamese to the negotiating table, at that point, there would be a possibility of having a settlement. 
And Rick says, Mr. Secretary, what if that doesn't work? <laughs> and I'll never forget, Rusk smoked Lark cigarettes, of all things. <laughs> and he, he, he put his hands like this, and he said, well, somebody's going to get hurt. Well, actually, the people that were going to get hurt were right there in the room that he was talking to, in addition to which, that didn't seem to me to be a wise policy. That answer, everybody recalled that answer as not being very thoughtful or not being very strategic and not being able to go around the corner and think about what next steps were. So when I say, and you say, that it alienated a whole generation, I think the war in Vietnam lost the loyalty of football captains and fraternity captains and Don Siegelman, the president of the student body at the University of Alabama and um, people out at the University of Oregon. I can't remember all their names. Of course, David Harris was going to jail already, so he wasn't, he was resisting the draft. Um, but that was, an, I think, a, a significant moment in the development of a broad-based anti-war movement that included all components of the student body, not just the activist parts. So, Dave, I would yeah, agree, David, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree that it, it broadened the base considerably. I'm not sure about the Wisconsin football team. <laughs> um, because I remember vividly, remember S.I. Hayakawa? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, yeah. He was it, in California, though. Not yes, Wisconsin. but, but there, was, there were about 25 goons on the Wisconsin football team, all the white guys, from, who formed an S.I. Hayakawa uh, base club, and they would walk around the campus sort of trying to intimidate the anti-war protesters. So, but, but, but you're absolutely right that it broadened it in so many ways. Um, you know, so by the time 67, 68 rolled around, you were talking about the university-wide yes. protests as opposed to just... Just 200 yeah, activists who right. really... Although those 200 activists actually knew what was going on in Vietnam and had studied it. like <laughs> Because you. we had the teachers. Yes. Yeah. Um, whereas so many of them just were responding to sort of the culture of that moment. And, and uh, 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 they had the right instincts, but they didn't really know what was going on in Vietnam. So then what was the effect, do you think, David, of campus protests? I mean, Greg asked you a little bit about this last night as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's complicated, I honestly think. I mean, um, it certainly, um, it changed, the, the people who took part in those anti-war protests were, for the most part, changed forever by that, by a feeling of betrayal by uh, people in power. And it led to, I mean, I always try to teach people to be skeptical but not cynical, but it led to that then followed, you know, <clears throat> starting through the civil rights movement to Vietnam, to, to Watergate and Nixon. Um, it could border onto cynicism after a while, um, feeling that you've been betrayed so often by the government lying. Um, so it had that effect. I think it divided um, the country in a way that it's still riven. So much of it goes back to that period. Um, whether the anti-war movement helped end the war, it's really hard to make that argument because it continued all the way through, um, you know, into the early 70s to finally 1975. Um, but that doesn't, de that doesn't delegitimize the effort to end the war and what that meant. Um, and I've often said that, um, you know, so often politics and elections and, are um, sort of only quantified by policy and results. But there's another factor involved in, in, in life, which is inspiration. Um, and so, like Doris Kearns Goodwin, in her latest book, writes about her, her, her late husband, Dick Goodwin, who was a brilliant um, speechwriter, um, talking about John Kennedy going up to Ashland, Wisconsin, in 1960 during the primary in Wisconsin, and then revisiting it um, when he was president. And how Doris then interviewed people 50, 60 years later about that. And it still has a profound effect on the people in Ashland, the inspiration that Kennedy gave them. And so I think that, that that's true in so many aspects of life, that there's something beyond, uh, there's something soulful or spiritual and, and I think the anti-war movement created, built something in people um, who went through it of hope and constant understanding they have to keep trying.
Does that make it a failure though, Greg? Because if the, the idea that you had was to end the war or end it sooner, and if in fact <coughs> it had dubious if any impact on that, it, on an oh, individual no, I, no, basis no, no. it may have affected I, each person, <coughs> but, but was the anti-war movement a failure? No, no I, think, I think what happened in 67 and then into 68 in the anti-war movement had a huge impact on American political history. Um, the uh, the anti-war movement really became the engine for the new Democratic Party that challenged the Lyndon Johnson re-election campaign. Uh, and the, the vehicle for that was Gene McCarthy. Um, and by the way, it, it, um, that was an extraordinary contest as be in the various parts of the anti-war movement as to whether you work through democratic procedures and methods to try to change policy or whether you use civil disobedience. And um, when Gene McCarthy got 46% of the vote in New Hampshire, which should have been 60-40 for Johnson, and then Lyndon Johnson withdrew, I think that had a huge impact on the nation. And what I was about to say is that we heard from the, the vets about how the war changed them, and it's no question about it, war changes everything. Mm -hmm. But the anti-war movement changed us as well as we got involved in it. All these events at the universities are, I can remember every minute of every second you know, of those events. And every single university that I was, I was at Harvard and then at Yale, and then aware of other places, um, they all had the same issues, but they all handled them differently, some with greater success. Kingston, uh, Kingman Brewster at Yale um, organized a community meeting and de decided to invite everybody in the community to meet at the Yale hockey rink to have a debate about ROTC on campus. Mm -hmm. And he organized it like the Oxford Union. He designated three people to speak in favor of ROTC. He was gonna be one designated three people to speak against the ROTC, and then asked Professor Robert Dahl, the chairman of the political science department and an expert in democracy, to Robert be the chairman. Dahl? Dahl, D-H-L-L, D-H-D-A-H-L. Well, 3,780 people jammed into the hockey rink. And the first thing that happened was, of course, the community took the rules away from Kingman Brewster. Uh -huh. Michael Medved marched down, got recognized, and said, I move that we abolish the rules that President Brewster has adopted. Everybody, yes, the rules were abolished. The, the chairman said, I will recognize someone for and then someone against. And so that's the way we went through the evening. The next thing that happened was Stephen Cohen, who was at the law school, came marching down, got recognized, and said, we're not here to talk about ROTC. We're here to talk about the war in Vietnam. Whoa, the place went crazy. Mm -hmm. And he said, pointing up into the, three architects of the war in Vietnam are right up there in the corner. Cyrus Vance, Bill Bundy, and they're members of the, Harp, of the Yale Corporation. And the place went crazy. We didn't take over any buildings. There was no one fighting. It was all resolved, but it, it was important to have that done. That was the way Yale handled it. Wisconsin and Harvard weren't so successful. Exactly, yeah. And a lot of it depended on the creativity of the administration. Of the administration and the sensitivity. Uh, yeah. Brewster could have walked out when the, when the rules got taken. By the way, there was a vote. This is interesting. There was a vote at that meeting about whether ROTC should be taken off campus. 1,748 people voted to keep it on campus. 1,748 people voted to get it off campus. It was, it was just an absolute equal vote. Here we are now. What? <laughs> Who counted? <laughs> Graduate students. <laughs> it's now October of 2024, mm. and we are again seeing student protests, uh, especially last spring. We're coming up on the one-year anniversary of October 7th. Um, David, you mentioned last night that you think all movements are a combination of idealism and self-interest. Mm -hmm. How do you see campus protests today uh, and those two weights sort of counterbalancing one another? Well, with a few exceptions, there's far less self-interest. Uh, 
Um, you know, in, in the 60s, as I said, there was a draft. Every, every young man of my age, of Greg's age, had to deal with that in some fashion. Um, what are you going to do? Are you going to enlist? Are you going to go to prison? Are you going to go to Canada? Are you going to try to join the ROTC? And it was a, a, a or go daily... go to jail. Or go to jail, yeah. It was a daily discussion. Um, it fueled everything uh, about our lives. And um, there's, you know, the, the United States is only secondarily involved in what's happening in the Middle East right now. Um, there are no American troops uh, involved yet, thank goodness. Um, so that's a vast difference. Um, the idealism of the students is similar. So is some of the naivete of the students. Um, and, you know, um, but that's a minority of those students. But in the anti-war movement, there were some crazy people involved in that, too. Oh, yeah. Um, and that didn't help the movement. And, and similarly, in the protests, there's some, you know, the chants of from the river to the sea and, and some of the anti-Semitism is not helping anything. Um, you can certainly oppose Netanyahu and everything that he's done um, without opposing, uh, you know, a Jewish, uh, the existence of a Jewish state. Um, so, you know, so there's, all of those are similarities. Um, but I think it's mostly different, honestly. I, I, I don't see uh, the most important comparisons I don't see there. Um, because the Vietnam, to me, uh, the war in Vietnam was clearly wrong from the beginning. It was a clear-cut case. And the Middle East is so complicated that nobody as smart as Senator Leahy could figure out what to do, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's really, it's just, it's going on forever, and it's, it's just, there are no easy answers to any of it. And the answer to Vietnam was get out. Greg, what do you think? I mean, where do you see that? Um, no, I agree with, with David. I, I do think that the relationship between the university community in the United States and what is happening in Gaza or the Pekka Valley is more tenuous than um, what was going on in Vietnam, ROTC, Dow, CIA, uh, during the 60s. And so that I'm not sure I understand exactly why someone who loves the university community, loves academia for all its faults, uh, I don't understand how uh, occupying a building uh, helps uh, the cause of peace in the Middle East. So I would be raising questions about the strategies that are being used by the student demonstrators there. I would have been focusing, I think, on humanitarian issues if I were a student activist now rather than policy issues because of the complexity um, of the policy issues and the fact that it's impossible to get um, adequate um, assistance to starving and damaged mm -hmm. populations. That would be the source of my, but I think the the model that they're using today on the university campuses is the anti-apartheid model that was used back um, in the late 80s, which I think had a very important effect. And by the way, I think the encampment, for example, at Harvard was um, a very positive thing, and it was handled well by the, by the Harvard negotiators up until the time of the, of the graduation. The encampment there was very much like a teach-in. There was a huge effort to have regional information, education, history, understanding, debates in that encampment inside the yard. Um, and so not everything was just protest and hostile and violent. There were aspects to what happened in the university campuses associated with Gaza that were very positive. Um, and I, th I, I credit that the kids care about this stuff. Sure. And I, I, will, I will say that for American students to be sufficiently concerned about the welfare of populations that are being bombed every day, I think that's a good thing mm -hmm. for them to care about that. Yep. You know, it's interesting, last night, David, when you were speaking, you, you rolled off a phrase and, and we moved on, but there was a, a palpable reaction in the room when you said that, in one of the sub-themes of your book, about Vietnam is the betrayal of the young 
by the old mm -hmm. and the rank and file by the leadership. And that doesn't apply just to Vietnam. I think in, in any situation, you know, as generations emerge, the young often feel betrayed by the old. And you could feel in the room last night that students reacted to that. Mm -hmm. And your generation are now the olds. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. and I think young people still feel betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Leahy is reacting to it. <laughs> well, I think they have a reason to. I mean, the, the, the world that we've left them, you know, in terms of uh, the environment. Um, but I should say, you know, I, I'm now an old guy, but I, I honor my elders, you know. I mean, I think it's people in power who are the ones who betray, not all. I mean, we sh there's so much to learn from old people. Um, there's an enormous wisdom there. Um, and on the other side, uh, when you look at the political reality of today, Donald Trump's main support comes from people over 65, you know, which is yeah. unbelievable, isn't it? But so there's a betrayal there. But I think in so many different ways, um, the world that we've left the young um, is not what we should have, and not what, we, what my generation thought we would be leaving them. Um, it's not all our fault, but it's but none. You know, I I feel that young people. I mean, I I I teach at Vanderbilt. I I I love this Generation Z. I think they have uh, uh, more idealism and a little less self-interest than my generation in some ways, um, but. Uh, I just wish we'd left them a better world. Where do you fall on this, Greg? I mean, this idea that... Well, um, I'm someone that does not believe in collective guilt. <laughs> um, I gave a, a the, the class day speech at Harvard when I graduated, and I talked about a new generation coming that would change everything. And um, boy, was, was I wrong. And this notion that it was the older generation that was responsible for Vietnam as opposed to some other component of the older generation. I mean, I agree with you. The military betrayed its, its trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The political leadership betrayed uh, its duty of candor and honesty to the American people. And it was not just the Democrats. It was the Republicans. It was the leadership of the Senate Armed Services Committee who knew what was going on and did nothing about it and did not insist on truth from the military leadership. Um, a, a lot of the anti-war movement is criticized for not being more welcoming to the military when they returned. I don't think we had anything against, at, nothing whatsoever against the American soldiers who went and, and fought. We had everything against the leadership in country who was making body count the, the measure of success and then lying about it, and the leadership in Washington, D.C., who was also deceiving the president as well as the, the Congress to a certain extent. So yes, there was a good deal of anti-military thoughts in terms of collective guilt back then, uh, but there was a basis for it, and I think that, um, actually, I, I, it's time for a, a, a better reckoning of all this. We, we, had, we never had a truth and reconciliation conference about Vietnam. This is not even coming close to it, but it's the only thing I've ever seen that discusses both from the veterans' point of view as from the off, mm -hmm. from, we need some policy makers too, but there's never been that kind of effort, what they call in the military an after action report, right. to find out exactly what went wrong and how it went wrong and why it went wrong. The Pentagon Papers didn't do it, it was just simply a report about what was done rather than any inquiry of why but why? Um, <laughs> it's time for that reckoning, long overdue time for that reckoning, so that there's a, a commonly accepted set of facts as to what was done and why it was done. Commonly accepted set of facts. <laughs> <laughs> you mean dream on? Yeah, right. in this world, I'm afraid. We have about 10 minutes for questions if anybody in the audience has one they'd like to raise. We have someone over here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I got to this campus in 1967 mm -hmm. and uh, had pre-planned and did uh, enroll in ROTC. Uh, while 
watching the rest of the campus, uh, of course, uh, basically explode like every other campus in terms of, of the uh, did across the country. Then I spent the next four years after I graduated in the Army. So I got to view multiple perspectives. Um, I'm curious, um, and, and I'll say, I'm, I'm just going to put these two pictures up on the table later. Mm. One is of the protesters, and the other is of us in uniform uh, in a parade uh, instant. And we were side by side. So it's, I keep them in my uh, office to remember what the days were like. But I'm curious, you both talked about, uh, obviously there was, uh, the military lost its moral compass, I think is basically what I've always felt about this. And meanwhile, the political leaders lacked the, I guess, uh, the kind of wisdom and, and um, strength that Senator Leahy and, and a few others have demonstrated over the years. We're in a, we're in a country where the civilians tell the military what to do. In this case, the civilians got bad information. What do you think could have been done whereby the civilian government could have done more um, to come to a different conclusion than sending all those people to Vietnam? Well, I, I mean, as I say in the book and said last night, the, the civilian government, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, his whole war council, knew that they were not going to win this war. Um, so um, they continued it for uh, political reasons, um, more than military reasons, um, some of it having to do with the history of, of the Democratic Party and not wanting to be, appear to be weak, um, which has continued over, you know, it's finally, been, that sort of notion is finally breaking, but it, it was extensive for almost 50 years um, with parts of the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, the, the military leadership, Westmoreland in particular, was pushing for more and more men, you know, up to 600,000, and, and Johnson could have stopped that. The, the, you know, the president, it, I mean, I, Congress um, was, you know, was, was getting more and more um, to understand that this wasn't going to work, but but Johnson by 1967 knew that um, before the majority of senators realized it. So I just think it was a matter of of uh, courage, um, which he showed in other ways. You know, his courage on uh, voting rights and civil rights was tremendous, and he knew that what he was doing might affect the future of his party. But he did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. So he could have done the same thing again and saved you know, thousands of lives and, and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese lives. Thank you both for being here. Um, this is probably more for Greg. So did you ever feel uh, that there are ramifications for your protests in terms of your professional aspirations? And what do you think of the law firms that are uh, now uh, blacklisting kids who are protesting? Um, at the time, I thought there, there might be ramifications. Um, and the, uh, the moment came when I was being considered for a job in the um, Clinton administration for Warren Christopher, and I, I went in and, and talked to the Deputy Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, and um, I said, um, you may not know this, but I was very much involved in the anti-war movement. I'm sure there's an FBI file <laughs> that's wide and big and deep. And um, he says, it doesn't make any difference to me. So I think it made a difference to some people. It might have made a difference if I was trying to be confirmed by the United States Senate, for, but I wasn't. I don't think it would make a difference today, but I did get my FBI file, and I wasn't disappointed. It was... <laughs> <laughs> and what about today's students? Um, I, I think um, some of the <coughs> most talented and thoughtful and caring and energetic and um, resourceful 
people on campus today are probably the ones that are involved in these activities. So if I were hiring someone, I would really want to make sure that um, this was not someone who was a disruptor that could work as a member of the team and his attitude or her attitude towards authority wasn't knee-jerk against authority. But I wouldn't hold the fact of a demonstration against them. So I think as a policy, that's a terrible mistake. Now what happened you know, at Harvard with this walkout, what happened at Harvard was the encampment left under the representation from the university that there would be no adverse action taken against the people that had engaged in the encampment. That was overruled by the Harvard Corporation. Mm -hmm. And I think seven people, two of them Rhodes Scholars, five of them top of the class, some of the best people in the graduating class were denied their certificate, their BA. Um, and that's when the Harvard class walked out from the commencement. I would have been walking out with them. My favorite, I teach at Vanderbilt uh, every other year. And uh, in my seminar on political biography, by far the sharpest student in my class took part in the uh, sit-in at the chancellor's office at Vanderbilt and was expelled. And it's Vanderbilt's loss, and now NYU's gain, because that's where he is now. <laughs> Another question? Good question. So there's very clearly a lot of talk about leadership here. And one of my best mentors taught me that there's a fine line between leadership and manipulation. Um, that's very clear today, and that's very clear from the past. So I'd be curious to know, what kind of manipulation and propaganda have you seen on uh, either campus protests on either side, and how do you see that playing into today? You know, I'm going to have to duck that. I'm, for me to portray myself as an expert as what's going on the campuses today, I just, that would be, I, I just don't know enough to answer that in terms of whether the, the kids are being dishonest. They certainly have a capacity to be deceptive and manipulative, or whether the university authorities uh, are deceptive and they certainly have that capacity too. I've seen it on both sides, but I just am not sufficiently plugged into what, what's going on in the universities today to answer that. I'm not sure you could generalize either, by the way. It might change from campus to campus and personality to personality. What did you mean by manipulation? Uh, propaganda. Propaganda. Well, I think that we're all subject to propaganda in one way or another. Um, and people try to put the best light on what they're doing um, and what they believe, you know, um, which can be seen as manipulation. I, I tend to look, I mean, there's a fine line between leadership and manipulation. There's also a fine line between manipulation and, and flexibility. So you could look at great leaders from Abraham Lincoln to uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who you could say manipulated the situations, but they were just finding the flexibility to maneuver to get where they wanted to go. So, um, but in terms of what, I, I, I can't give you the answer of today either, because um, aside from being at Vanderbilt and watching it a little bit, I, I didn't really involve myself in, in, in the, the intricacies of what was going on. So, so I was involved in two White Houses, Clinton yeah. White House, Obama White House. We spent every day trying to figure out how to manipulate the exactly. Congress of the United States. And how, to, <laughs> and how to manipulate journalists. Oh, no, 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 we never did that. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one final question. I'd like to speak for the uh, leaders of the movement at Cornell, which was called the Berkeley uh, of the East. Yeah. I was a Catholic chaplain, worked with Dan Bergen and Phil Bergen at the uh, burning of draft cards in Catonsville, and myself turned in my own draft card. But the leaders for me were the students. They had studied. I would go to the SDS meetings, and I would find out how much they knew about Olin Chemical, who were coming to draft people on campus, but were making Agent Orange. And so the students themselves knew more than the faculty, the administrators and the, and the people that funded Cornell about what was going on in apartheid in South Africa, what was going on in the Middle East. And so I'd just like to make sure that we knew who the leaders were. They were so smart 
that they not only knew the facts, but they worked with the campus police and they look, worked with the administrators. And when they marched, they made sure there was no hate speech allowed to march with them. So I just want to say a good word about the ones that taught me a lot. Thank you. I would agree with that at Wisconsin, that the, the, uh, le the student leaders understood the connection between Dow Chemical Company and the war and the war machine. And one of the, the great, um, I don't know if it's an irony, but an interesting contradiction or connection is that here were these students protesting against Dow Chemical Company, the makers of Agent Orange, and here were these soldiers fighting in Vietnam, um, and many of whom I wrote about who died probably from the effects of Agent Orange. So there was a connection there that, that the soldiers couldn't see at the time, and maybe you know, the, 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 the uh, protesters weren't thinking so much about the soldiers as about the war itself. Um, but in a sense, those protesters were trying to stop something that, that would harm the soldiers. Um, I wish I could say that all student leaders of the anti-war movement were worthy of respect and admiration, but they weren't. Uh, the anti-war movement made terrible mistakes, which in some respects prolonged the war. I think, by the way, Jane Fonda was not a great asset in the anti-war movement at all. It was, to, to end the war, you had to appeal to American pride and patriotism um, and respect and love for country rather than supporting the opposition who was killing our soldiers. Um, no matter what the cause, uh, the strategy of ending the war did not include waving North Vietnamese flags at demonstrations. It did not include what Abby Hoffman did and Jerry Rubin did all the time when they made speeches. The Yippies were not a great contributor to the anti-war movement when Jerry Rubin called on children to murder their parents or when every other word out of Abby Hoffman's mouth began with the, word, with the letter F. This was not something that was meant or successful at persuading American people that the war in Vietnam was wrong. It, it persuaded them that the people that were opposing the war were wrong. It, as Bill Coffin said, you want to have them reevaluate our policy, not to reevaluate you. And there were those who led the anti-war movement um, that did damage to the cause. We're gonna leave it there for this. We have one more panel still to come. And, and as we move from campus protests to thinking about the legacy of war and where we are today. But I wanna say a, a big thank you to David Marinus and Gregory Craig for being here and being part of this conversation today. Thank you both. Thank you.